better is one day in your courts than a thousand elsewhere. You know, for the last couple of weeks, we've been learning about the dwelling place where we can meet God and come into his presence as Minister Ronald and Elder Kevin have taught us about coming into the presence of God and showing us the Old Testament uh, tabernacle in all of its dimensions. I want to thank them for teaching us well. Their messages were both uh, inspirational and informational. I also want to thank you uh, for all of your well wishes to Amber and I over this last month, the things that you have written online and so on and so forth with our uh, website there at bridgeway.cc. Thank you for your kind words as we've celebrated our anniversary and, and our church's anniversary and our wedding anniversary and our birthdays, all that good stuff. So thank you so much. Next week, I'm going to give the end of the year wrap up. Can you believe it? We are now at the end of the ministry year, and I'm going to talk a little bit about where we have come from as well as where we're going, and I've invited our clergy to be with me to have a clergy conversation about our ministry over the last year. So uh, I look forward to you joining us next week for our end of the year wrap up. Let's bow for just a short word of prayer, and then we're going to get right into this message you're under arrest as we kind of bring the dwelling place thoughts to a climax, if you will. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word, and we pray that your word would now go into us in a very deep place that would bring change in our lives. For one moment in your presence can indeed change our lives forever. For it is in the name of Jesus we commit today's message to you. Together, everyone said amen. And amen. Well, the passage of Psalm 84 is the passage that we've been looking at the last couple of weeks. I'd like to go back there to talk about going into the presence of God. And specifically, as we have seen from the Old Testament standpoint, the, the dimensions of the tabernacle, I want to focus in now on really just one or two verses in that whole passage of Psalm 84. I'm going to pick it up right around verse 8, and I'll read through verse 12. So let's zero in there, and then there's a particular verse, verse 11, that I'm going to rest on here for most of the message, and then we're going to shift to the New Testament to pull it all together. Here it comes from the NIV, Psalm 84, verse 8. Hear my prayer, O Lord God Almighty. Listen to me, O God of Jacob. Selah. Look upon our shield, O God. Look with favor on your anointed one. Better is one day in your courts than a thousand elsewhere. I would rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than dwell in the tents of the wicked. Verse 11, for the Lord God is a sun and shield. The Lord bestows favor and honor. No good thing does he withhold from those whose walk is blameless. O Lord Almighty, blessed is the man who trusts in you. May God add a blessing to the reading of his word, even as Sophia has read it uh, earlier, and now you've heard it in your hearing again. Let me focus in on verse 11, which says, For the Lord God is a sun and shield. The Lord bestows favor and honor. No good thing does he withhold from those whose walk is blameless. There are three parts to this verse. The first part says, for the Lord is sun and shield, meaning that he is our source and he is our protection. God produces the sun, he gives us light, he gives us heat, but he also protects us from the burning light and burning heat. There's a second part to this verse, though, and this is what it says. The Lord bestows favor and honor. Favor is mentioned twice, actually. In verse 8, it says, look with favor on your anointed one. And in verse 11, it says, the Lord bestows favor and honor. Question, does anybody need the favor of God today? Favor is God's unmerited blessing of grace upon our life that is unearned. Favor is when you know you don't deserve access, but you are granted unhindered access and privilege beyond and above your pay grade. Favor is that unmerited and undeserved grace upon your life that you simply cannot explain. 
I thank God for the favor he has upon my life. I thank God for the anointing he has upon my life. I know I don't deserve it. I know I'm not worthy of it. But someone put it like this, favor ain't fair. (laughs) I mean, if God was fair, I, I wouldn't be alive today. By the way, you wouldn't be either. Maybe you ought to just say amen to that right now. Like, God, I wouldn't even be here if it wasn't for your favor. In fact, who amongst us today would still be here if it wasn't for the grace of God? Hence, there's a third part to this verse, and that's the part I really want to focus in on. It says, no good thing does he withhold. I I like that part, but it doesn't stop there. No good thing does he withhold, here it is, from those whose walk is blameless. Oh, snap. That is the part right there that causes me a little problem. Who among us is blameless? Are you blameless? Is your family member or friend who you're watching the service with right now, are they blameless? Are your children blameless? Is your spouse or significant other blameless? Hang on. Do you know anyone? Who's blameless? How do we enter into the dwelling of God blameless? We we learned over the last couple of weeks about the particulars of the tabernacle. We learned how the people of God were to enter into this holy and and sacred place, having been cleansed and and washed. We We were taught about the process of transitioning from a profane world outside of the tabernacle to a profound God inside of the holy of holies. And and in order for all of this to happen, there would need to be protocols of cleansing ourselves and sacrifices of innocent blood of animals and even a priest that would go between us and God. By the way, why sacrifice animals? Why not sacrifice human beings? Have you ever wondered about that? I mean, what did that little goat do? What did that little lamb do? What did that bull do wrong? And that was the point. Animals were an innocent third party who did no wrong. They had no willful sin. Animals didn't have human free will to sin against God. So a human sacrifice wouldn't be acceptable because the blood of humans is scarred by the profane sinfulness of corrupt people. So a human sacrifice wouldn't be acceptable. So the blood of humans is not innocent. The blood of humans is not worthy enough to be an acceptable sacrifice to God. But an animal... You might actually remember in Genesis 22, the story of Abraham, who was told to to take his son uh, Isaac up to Mount Moriah and to sacrifice him to God. Do you remember that story in Genesis 22? So Abraham, out of obedience to God, proceeds with his son Isaac to take him to a place of sacrifice. And right when Abraham was about to lift the knife, Right when he was about to strike his son, believing in his heart that he would be raised again, his son would be raised again by God. But the son that he had long waited for, this son that he had worked for, this son that he had believed God for, finally comes into his life. And now God is saying, take the very thing that I have promised you, and I want you to sacrifice it to me. Do you trust me? Do you believe in me? And you remember the story, don't you? What happened? Right when the knife was lifted and Abraham was about to sacrifice his son. Do you remember? What did God provide? Well, God stopped Abraham. Seeing his willingness to obey God, he provided him with a ram in the bush. Is anybody thankful for those ram in the bush moments when when God comes through in just the nick of time? We serve a God who always comes through. The old saints in my church growing up used to put it this way. He may not come when you want him, but he's right on time. Yes, we serve an on-time God. Amen and amen. But guess what? 
nothing against Isaac and praise God for Abraham's obedience. But honestly, God knew that the ram was a better sacrifice than the boy. Why? Because the ram was an innocent third party that had not sinned or been corrupted. It may have been a part of a fallen world, but it did not choose with human volition to disobey God. And so a human sacrifice, unless it was absolutely perfect, would not do. But an animal, an innocent third party caught in a thicket was exactly a better sacrifice than his own human son. There is only one perfect, blameless, sinless human being that has walked on this planet that is worthy as an offering to an almighty God to satisfy what God must receive from us. And we know who that is. The Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Jesus. The only perfect human being who would be a worthy sacrifice. So if it's only Jesus... And yet it's better for me to come into the presence of God and I go through all these Old Testament protocols. Then what of those passages like Psalm 84 that talk about blamelessness? No good thing does he withhold from those whose walk is blameless. I ask again, who among us is blameless or righteous? What about passages like Proverbs 3, 33, the the passage I often use when I'm blessing someone's home? which says the Lord's curse is on the house of the wicked, but he blesses the home of the righteous. I always wonder when I read the verse, how does that actually feel to the family? He curses the house of the wicked, but he blesses the home of the righteous. I wonder if they think in their mind, oh, I wonder if this house is righteous. Let me ask you this. Do you want God to bless your home? Do you want God to consider your home righteous? Would God consider your home, the one I'm speaking in right now, would he consider your home righteous? Would he consider you righteous? Here's a question. Would you consider you (laughs) righteous? Not only Psalm 333, but what about the story of Job? Remember in Job, God actually says Job is righteous. It says in Job 1.1, he was called blameless and righteous. And then when he has a conversation with Satan in verse 8, he says, have you considered my servant Job? And he calls him blameless and righteous. I mean, can you imagine God thinking of you that way? Hey, hey, devil, have you considered my servant Gina? Have you considered my servant Rebecca? Have you considered my servant Leslie, Lauren, Leroy, have you considered my servant David? In other words, I believe that he is so blameless and and upright that if I take all the goodies away from him, and if I allow you access to do everything but kill him, he's going to still praise me anyhow. You're going to take away his health. You're going to take away his wealth. You're going to take away his relationships. You're going to take away his children. You're going to take away everything that matters to him. Have you considered Frank? Have you considered Dave? I mean, would God actually say that and fill in the blank with you? I'm going to pretty much guarantee you he's not going to say David Anderson. Because you start taking that stuff away from me unless there's an extra dose of Holy Spirit strength. I'm done. I have a friend who just lost his baby sister. She was uh, 45 years old. Uh, Two weeks ago, she caught COVID, and then she died. Two weeks later, she wasn't vaccinated, dead. I sat with him for hours yesterday, and he's a middle child. It was two boys and a girl, and he's the middle one. So it'd be like my son Luke losing his sister, Asia, and and, and just the, 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 the pain of of having to enter in with him to what he's experiencing. And you know what happens at funerals. You think about your loved one. So if it's someone else's spouse, you think about your spouse. If it's someone else's parent, you think about your parent. That's the way it usually goes because we we grieve with one another. And as he 
is grieving his pain. I am thinking about what that would be like for, 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 for my family. And I realize, man, would I not be upset? Would I not be angry? Would I not be destitute? And maybe if they just died that way, maybe that's okay. But how if they die because of a murder? Or how if they die like the lady who called my radio show this week and said, a, a, a drunk driver hit me. I've lost everything. How do we come out of those things and still God would say, you know what? He's blameless. She's blameless. I've given examples like Proverbs 3.33. I've given examples like Job. Let me give you one more example from the New Testament. The New Testament tells us that elders and pastors and overseers and deacons are called to be, here it is, 1 Timothy 3.2, blameless in order to be qualified to be in ministry without fault above reproach. So let me ask it a third and final time. Who among us is blameless and righteous? Well, it's here that I want to transition and move from Psalm 84 to a New Testament passage to show us what's going on here. And we find that in Hebrews chapter 4. So if you'd be so kind, turn with me to Hebrews chapter 4. And let's look at verses 12 through 16. Come with me. And see where the beauty and the power and the amazing truth of Hebrews 4, 12 through 16 helps us as we come into the very presence of God. Turn there. Because as I go into the passage and read it to you from the New International Version, you need to understand that if we are going to enter into the most holy place, if we're going to enter into the dwelling place of Almighty God, if we're going to relate to the holiest being in the universe, then we must enter into the Sabbath rest of Jesus Christ. In other words, there is no amount of Old Testament washings and cleansings and animal sacrifices and ceremonial processes and protocols that would allow us to come into a true relationship with God. That's why in the Old Testament they needed a priest to go in to the Holy of Holies. The priest went into the most holy place on the behalf of the people. But we're now talking about an actual one-on-one -on -one relationship with God. And all of those processes of the Old Testament were foreshadowing what Jesus would do for us so that we could come into an unstained and sustained relationship with Almighty God. You see, our faith with this Sabbath God, our, our faith with this Jesus Christ, our faith that would believe that God could open a door for us would purify us from all the unrighteousness. And it is in Christ that we are ushered into the throne room of God. It is Jesus Christ who ushers us into the very holiest of holies. He is the high priest that goes into the room, and because we are in him, cleansed by him, we can come into a relationship with God. It is Jesus Christ who ushers us into the throne room of God because he is the doorkeeper. I'd rather be a doorkeeper in the house of God than to be dwelling in the tents of the wicked. Who's our doorkeeper? Jesus is. He says in John 10, he says, I am the door. I am the gate. Jesus is your usher. He's your frontline greeter. He's the one that brings you in to the very presence of God. He is our substitutionary, atoning human sacrifice because he was perfect as a human he is our high priest, and as a result, he says in John 10, 7, I am the door for the sheep. The only reason we can come into the presence of God is because we have a really, really good doorkeeper. And he says, there's only one way to the Father, and that's through me. I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. No one comes to Father God except through me. Hebrews 4.12, for the word of God is alive and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to the dividing of soul and spirit's joints 
and marrow. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. Verse 13, nothing in all of creation is hidden from God's sight. Everything is uncovered and laid bare before the eyes of him to whom we must give account. Verse 14, therefore, since we have a great high priest, that's Jesus, who has ascended into the heavens, Jesus, the son of God, let us hold firmly to the faith we profess. Verse 15, for we do not have a high priest who is unable to empathize or sympathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way just as we are, yet he did not sin. He was the perfect human being. The last verse is verse 16. Let me read it. Let us then approach God's throne with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. In this passage, we see God's word, the power of his word. We see the power of his love. Let's look at the power of his word in verse 12. For the word of the Lord is alive and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates the dividing of soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. There are four truths right here about the powerful word of God. Number one, it's alive. It says it. For the word of God is alive. God's word is living. It's not an old, archaic book that sits on a table at your parents' or grandparents' house that never gets read. No, it is living. When God spoke it, he spoke it through the living breath of Jesus Christ. It's living. It's active. It's alive. It says, for the word of God is alive. And secondly, it's active. That means that it's in motion. It's always working. Third, it's accurate. It says sharper than any double-edged sword. It says it penetrates. God's word has the ability, even as I'm preaching it. Whether you're in your bathroom or in your bedroom, God's word has the ability to penetrate and be very accurate in your particular situation to the degree that it can even slice and, 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 and penetrate to the dividing of soul. Do you know how hard it is to penetrate soul and spirit? Like half the time, we don't know which is which, soul or spirit, psyche or, or mind. We're all, all so tight, but the word of God is so accurate it can split it. The word of God is so accurate between joint and marrow. You know, a bone with joint and marrow. That's just how precise it is. It's so precise, it says it judges thoughts and attitudes of the heart. Like how, how precise does that have to be? How accurate between thoughts and attitudes? Which one's a thought? Which one's an attitude? That's how accurate God's word is. It's alive. It's active. It's accurate. And fourth and finally, it's arresting. It says it judges and convicts and it lays bare before God. Everything, verse 13, nothing in all of creation is hidden from God's sight. Everything is uncovered and laid bare before the eyes of him to whom we must give an account. It's arresting. It judges. It convicts. It lays bare all of our mess. In other words, God in his word puts us under arrest. How do you enter the rest of God when you're under arrest by the powerful conviction of his word? There is only one answer, and that is this. You must admit, guilty as charged. Guilty as charged. You don't lie. You don't plea bargain. You don't try to make a deal with God. You admit to God that you are not blameless, that you are not righteous, that you are not holy. You put your hands up before God. You fall on the mercy of the court and you say to God, hands up, don't shoot. You come to God in a posture of surrender. And it takes faith to believe that a holy God won't shoot. That a holy God won't annihilate you on the spot. But yet because of the powerful conviction of God's word that puts us under arrest, we also see the powerful love of God that doesn't annihilate us when he should. The only reason we can come into the presence of a holy God and not be annihilated 
which is exactly what would have happened in the Old Testament with all the protocols that we learned the last couple of weeks, is because of God's love for us demonstrated in Jesus Christ. John 3, 16 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. So when we hold on to our faith, when we believe the truth that God does love us, and when we've turned our lives over to him for eternity, when we truly believe that nothing can separate us from the love of God, as Romans 8 teaches, then, my friend, then we can come into the holy throne room of God with confidence. And verse 16 gives us that confidence. It also gives us three practical applications of how we're supposed to come into the presence of a holy God. Go with me. Let's look at verse 16. If you look at 16a, here's the here's a practical application. Number one, come before God with confidence. Come before God with confidence. It says at the beginning of the verse, let us then approach the throne of grace with what? With confidence. Some of your texts say in the, in the King James Version, come boldly to the throne of grace. God invites us to come before him boldly, not arrogantly. There's a difference between bold and arrogant. You know, arrogance is that attitude of presumption. Arrogance is that attitude of entitlement. Arrogance is that attitude of worthiness. You see, confidence is about trust. Trusting in the one who bids you to come. Confidence is about a relationship of safety, knowing that your transparency and, and that your intimacy will not be rejected, but will be rewarded. Intimacy. Remember, into me I see that when he sees into me, somehow he won't annihilate me, but because of a relationship of safety, if I'm transparent and show myself to him, if I fall on the mercy of the court, if I throw my hands up and ask for God's mercy, that relationship of safety tells me that I can have confidence that he's not going to annihilate me. Confidence about having faith in God's promise based on who he is and based on what he said. It says in verse 14, let us hold firmly to the faith we profess. So that's the first practical application, come confidently. Secondly, come before God to receive mercy. It says, it says so that you may receive mercy. You know what mercy is, right? Mercy is what God offers to the guilty who deserve punishment who deserve consequences, who ultimately deserve death. Mercy is not giving you what you do deserve. David said it like this in Psalm 103, verse 10. He does not treat us as our sins, here it is, deserve or repay us for our iniquities. What kind of God is that? What kind of judge is that? That is mercy. Jeremiah says it like this in Lamentations 3, 23. His mercies are new Every morning, great is his faithfulness. So one, you come confidently. Two, you come to receive mercy. And three, and finally, come before God to find grace. It says, so that you may receive mercy and find grace to help in our time of need. Grace is giving you what you do not deserve. Mercy is not giving you what you do deserve. Grace is giving you what you do not deserve. Grace is extending unmerited favor that you cannot repay or, and it can never be earned. And how amazing is it that we could come to the throne room of God and receive? Think about that. We come before God and we receive. What kind of God does that? We come broken, transparent, real, honest, and in exchange with all of the mess that we bring before him. When we say, please have mercy, hands up, don't shoot. God then says, after all that I know about you, after all that I've seen in your thoughts, after all that I've seen in your attitudes, after all that I have seen in your motivations, in your behaviors, in your secret sins, after all that I know about you, after all that I know about your parents, after all that I know about your children, after all that I know about everything about you, you stand before me and say, guilty is charged. 
And this God, this God, says I have gifts of mercy and grace to give you. That's like going to somebody's party who they're celebrating something. You take them a gift, but you walk away with the gift. You know what they call those? Party favors. <laughs> How do you go to some party that's supposed to be about somebody else and you walk away with the gift? You come into God's throne room. You should get everything that is annihilating and killing for eternity. And what does he do? He says, I have gifts for you. Mercy and grace. It just doesn't make sense. Maybe that's why they call it grace. And then, if you really want to trip this thing out as we bring the message to a close, human hearts that have been overwhelmed with God's saving grace because they're so thankful for his mercy, thankful for his grace, thankful for his sacrifice, a human heart that receives that saving grace now become the dwelling place for God. What? You're going to make me your dwelling place? <laughs> it doesn't make sense. The Old Testament concept of dwelling with God was in a tabernacle where his presence was, a temple where his presence was, the Ark of the Covenant, which we didn't get to, which was where his presence resides. It's a place where he inhabits. But now in the New Testament, he's saying, guess what? You, human hearts, will be the dwelling place of God. You will be the temple of the Holy Spirit. We humans are his tabernacle. We humans are his temple of the living God. He makes his abode with us. He makes his abode in us. So what kind of home are you making for a God in your heart? This God says, I stand at the door and I knock. If anybody would open the door and let me in. I will fellowship and sup with him and he with me. In closing, as, as an American and in America, when you're under arrest, the authorities read you something called your rights. Your rights. They say you're under arrest. You have the right to remain silent. What you say can be used against you in a court of law. You have the right to an attorney, blah, blah, blah. But when you come before a holy God, we don't even have a right to breathe. So when the devil brings up charges against us of lying and cheating and stealing and fornicating and adultery and lusting and gossip, and porn surfing, and drunkenness, and deception, and pride, and evil thoughts, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. We stand before a holy God, guilty as charged. And the best thing we can do is lift our hands and surrender, knowing that we are guilty as charged, with no defense. But here's the good news. We serve a defense attorney who has never lost a case. Jesus Christ stands as our defender, as our lawyer. And Jesus says to Almighty God, who is the judge, Father, the devil is right. This man has sinned. He has fallen short of the glory of God. He has cheated and stolen and robbed. He has lusted and he has been selfish. The list of his and her sins are many. Because his or her sins are right up here on display. I come before you to tell you that I have applied all of his punishment and all of her punishment on me. I became sin for her. And by my stripes, she's healed. I was wounded for her transgressions. I was bruised for her iniquities. Your honor, because of me and my sacrifice, as a perfect human being, the only son of God, the blameless, perfect, righteous one, her debt has been paid in full. His debt has been paid in full. God, the judge, says, well, in that case, 
case dismissed. No matter what the devil brings against you, I will separate your sins as far as the east is from the west. I will remember your sins no more. Case dismissed. And once you've received the mercy and the grace of God, you can't help but sing that song with conviction. Amazing grace. How sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind, but now I see. Amen and amen.